Good day to you. My name is Tony Ballinger from the Fighting Men of Rhodesia series. Uh, it's my pleasure today to bring on board Loris Basson, a lovely sounding name. I'll ask him what that refers to in a moment. But um, Loris, having read through your presentation, it's a really fascinating story. Uh, it'll be good for all of us to, to hear it and learn from your experiences. And it's, uh, it's good because it's not entirely about combat, although you saw stuff going on the, on the farms around you. And it's, um, it's a branch of the Fighting Men of Rhodesia series that we want to incorporate is civilians and what they experienced in the war. So this is going to be a good talk, and it leads on to your um, move to South Africa and getting involved in the South African Air Force, which is fascinating. And it just goes to show that um, our early um, people that trekked into Rhodesia um, set up a really good standard of living, good standard of education, and that carried forward to leaving the country eventually and, and setting up um, other lives for ourselves, which I've done for myself here in England. But, um, Loris, welcome to you. And um, we're going to look at a presentation as he talks, and um, it'll, it'll make the whole thing come alive. So over, over to you, Loris. Thank you, Tony. Firstly, I want to thank you for inviting me to come and speak here. It's truly a privilege and an honor. Um, also, I would like to thank, before I start, you, John, and Hannes, for the work you're doing here on fighting men of Rhodesia, you know, to capture our history in such a personal detail way is it's invaluable. You know, we I always tell the people we we're hearing history out of the horse's mouth, you know, which is much better than any book you can get. Mm. Um the now my as I told you, my story is not that exciting because I was a young farm boy. I did not serve in the military. I missed the war by about a year. But but hopefully um it will give some insight to what was life was like on the farm. Um, to people not familiar with the farm life, and those that did go up on the farm, hopefully they will, it will bring back good memories. As you said, I, I, it's best I talk of uh, the presentation because I um, would like to, uh, you know, there's a lot of references to maps and, and things like that. So um, um, can you see my screen? Absolutely. Looks good. Okay. Okay, so you can see here, yeah, young boy growing up on the farm, and this is my mealy field. Um, each year, you know, just in front, you had these big numbers, you know, white numbers that uh, the farm identified. So I would cultivate my own piece of land with a badza. You know, I didn't have a plow and plant the mealies, and yeah, as a young, proud farmer. Um, so I was born in Risapi, which is on the eastern side of the country between Salisbury and Umtali. And brought into this world, like my siblings, by Dr. Albert Malan. Now, his colleague was Dr. Strayham. So most people born in that time in Rusapi was most probably delivered by Dr. Malan and or Dr. Strayham. And speaking about Dr. Strayham, his daughter, Ilza, appeared on Fighting Men of Rhodesia a while ago. Now, we didn't have a dentist in Rusapi. There was a Dr. Nest, if I remember his name correctly, that came from Untali once a month. So if you had an emergency, Dr. Strayham was your local dentist to see in the meantime. My parents owned a farm called Yamangura, which is here. It's uh, about 20 kilometers northeast of Headlands, Headlands being the next town in the direction of Salisbury from Rusapi. Now, if I've got my historical facts correct, this Headlands was established by the Van der Beel track in the pioneering days of Rhodesia, and the leader was a Peter Lawrence Van der Beel. They were from the Cape. And it was first called Lawrence Dale, Lawrence being the English version of, the, in, in honor of him, because Lawrence being the English version of the Afrikaans Lawrence, and later it was changed to Headlands. And he's buried um, on a farm here between Headlands and Rusapi and Mona, and there's a, uh, on the farm called Mona between Headlands and Rusapi, uh, and there's a small monument there. My father, both, both my parents come from the Western Cape, my father came to Rhodesia at the young age of 23 in the late 40s, and that was on the recommendation of his uncle, Uncaro. Now, just for the benefit of people not familiar with Afrikaans traditions, we call older men Um, which is uncle, and older woman Tani, which is aunt, a son of respect, even if we're not family. Um, my father first worked for well, Martinez Martin, a farmer in the Nyanzura district, and in the latest Fighting Men of Rhodesia episode where Hannah speaks to Brian Murphy, they actually mention him because his son, Tini, played for Rhodesia. And he, when my father worked there, he was a youngster playing around on the farm. 
Uh, my father was a very good sportsman. He had, before coming to Rhodesia, he got his Western Province Junior Color in athletics, and you can see him here at Pole Vault. He, some, one day he was working on the pipes from the ball to the reservoir, and he showed us how to do uh, pole vaulting with a pipe. <laughs> Just grabbed it. So uh, very athletic. And then he also played um, uh, club rugby in the Western Province Club League. And then he first played for Inean Zura at club level. And at that time, they were a very strong team. They had um, Springboks like Salty Durant and Rijk van Skoer. And then later for Mayer Arms, Headlands and McConey. McConey is the Rusapi Rugby Club. And you can see here the photo of the 1957 team that won the White Horse Challenge each year in the corner, I believe. You can see my father here um, in circle. And this player here is, is our neighbor directly to the north, Umdainki van Espey, and I'll mention him quite a few times later in the, in the talk. This person here, is the, his name was is Kevin Curran, and he was the coach at that time, well-known in Rhodesian rugby circles. And a lot of people, the people that came from the Rusapi, Headlands, Utsi, Macheki, Inyanzura area would recognize people here. This uh, player here is Mbapru, one of my father's best friends, and I'll talk about him later, or mention him later again in the talk. And you can see the, the badge. My brother, this is the Blazer badge of the McConey Club. My brother still got the badge. I actually took a photo at his house. So um, then he played for Manikaland uh, rugby. You can see here's the jersey. I've got the jersey um, here in the house. There's a photo of that. And this is the 1956 um, team that won the Provincial Black and White Trophy. That was against Mashonaland, Midlands, and Matabililand. Again, you can see my father here. And once again, Umdainki van Espey, our neighbor directly to the north. And you can see here the person I mentioned in the previous slide by the name of Kevin Curran. Here he was still playing. And there's, as I said, there's a lot of people from Manikaland that would recognize players here. One of them being this person here, which is Vickers de Kok, a minister in parliament. Um, and then my father also played for Rhodesia rugby. Um, this is the 1952 touring team to the Cape. You can see my father here. And they played, went down and they played against um, Southwestern districts, Woolland and Western province. Now, this player here, his name was John Barrett, very well known in rugby circles. But my father never spoke about John. They called him Ox, most probably because he was as strong as an ox. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you can see again Umdainki van Espey, our neighbor to the north. And this player here, his name was Des van Jasveld. And um, actually, he's mentioned, if, if you look at the latest um, program of Fighting Men of Rhodesia, there's a photo of him because he, in his Springbok jersey, he later became a Springbok. And I think he was a captain also of the Springbok, if I remember correctly. Um, now, for me, this is quite a historical photo because you can see the players have signed it. You know, it's not just a photo. So, and um, so I think it's a very unique photo. Mm -hmm. And then my father played also against the 1955 Touring British and Iron Lions. This, these are the, this is the program here, um, and um, they played two games: one in Kitwe, in the then Northern Rhodesia, now um, Zambia. And then, then at Salisbury in the sports ground. And I, I've just extracted some bios here that's in these programs. Uh, my brother's got this. Yes, of my dad and talking about, he comes from the Cape and he played for Balbo and Umdainke. Um, He um, actually what played, he, they mentioned here, yeah, he was a Springbrook uh, trialist um, uh, a year uh, in 1955. He actually played for the Spring Junior Springboks, which is now called the um, South Africa A, the B team, the Springboks B team. And there, yes, the player that I mentioned previously by the name of Des van Yasso, that yeah, they mentioned he was a Springbok trialist, but he did become a Springbok. And as I said in that latest series, you can see in the front uh, where the photos are, there's one of him in his in his in his Springbok jersey. Uh, you'll note he went to Plumtree School, so if I remember correctly, John was is an old Plumtree boy, so he would be very proud <laughs> to hear that. Um, and then uh, this is the team that actually played against the 1955 British and Irish uh, Lions. Uh, this was the one team in Kitney, Kitwe. Again, my father, you can see him here. Umdainke van Espey here. And the player I mentioned that became a Springbok by the name of Des van Jansveld here. Now, this is the jersey my father played in that day um, against the British and Irish Lions. My brother still got it. He's got it nicely mounted in a frame. But the interesting thing here, he, my father was number 15, which is eighth man, which now, that nowadays, 15 is fullback. 
uh, at that time it was number one, so the numbers were totally um, different. They they changed it later years. Um, now, after my father worked for Martinez, he moved to um, um, work for a farmer in Mayo Ranch area, and then he leased the farm called Lonely Dale, uh, which is northeast of Headlands, um, as you can see here. And this is just a blow up of the area to give you a wider perspective. And that was just two farms away from the one that my parents eventually bought, Nyamangura. Now, the, the neighboring farm was Shiropa Vale to Lonely Dale, and the Nyati Mine was on that. Um, on, on the farm, um, on Shiropa Vale. And Inyati Mine played a very important role in our life, which I will talk more about later in, in the, during the war. The, the owner of this Lonely Dale farm was a, a widower. And at that time, the, the workers, the farm workers would give the farmers a nickname. And they were, and you had to earn it. It was very descriptive and, and apt to the situation. So she was called Mama Mauku. That was her name which um, Huku means chicken. So she was the mother of the chickens. And apparently how she got this name is, at that time we had party lines. So, um, you know, there were maybe four farmers or so. Also, when I grew up, we had maybe four farmers or so on the line and you had your own rinto. Now it was, for example, five short ones. Now, if two, were pick, two people were speaking on the line, you could pick up and listen in. And apparently this is what she used to do. <laughs> but unfortunately for her, the phone was very close to where the chickens roamed the yard. So when she's listening in, they could hear the chickens in the background giving her away talking. And that's apparently how she got the name Mama Maoku, Mother of the Chickens. That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> and then uh, my father and mother, um, my father met my mother. She was in Cape Town um, via his cousin. Um, we, he went on holiday to Cape Town and then went to see his cousin and she introduced him to my mother. Uh, they, his cousin and my mother worked together. They were best mates. Their flats were next to each other. So my parents got married in the um, Grote Kerk in the end of Adley Street in 1959. My father and his best friend, Mbopru, which I showed you on the Makoni rugby photo, they drove down in the Land Rover for the wedding. And my mother came back sitting nearly 3,000 kilometers between these two big men. Um, so, uh, and the other day I came across the paper where my mother got residence after they got married. She got residence in Rhodesia, it later became a citizen, but both my parents were Rhodesian citizens. Um, now, in the mid 60s, my parents bought the farm Yamangura. As I said, it was just two farms away from Lonely Dale. Um, there was the, the, the big, our large river through the area was Marazzi River, and this is the Marazzi Dam. And you can see Nyati Mine. Now, if you look at this map, you can see Nyati Mine is very close to us, and maybe a 15 minutes, 20 minutes drive. And Headlands was much further, maybe four, four times further, which I will uh, mention again later. Um, we, my, my father farmed with cattle, you know, the tobacco and um, the millies, like most farmers. Um, now, we, we are three children. I've got an older brother and a younger sister, uh, the older sister and a younger brother. We went to boarding school at Botasov, not a very big school. We were, I think, something like 400 people total from primary and um, um, high school. It actually started off as an orphanage in 1911 in Bilawaya. Then it moved to Guelo. In 1914, it became Daisyfield. And then in 1948, they bought a farm in Highfield, which is southeast of the Salisbury city center. And, and that's where Botasov was established. I think they still bought it for 18,000 pounds. Yeah. Now, our badge, as, as shown here, we had the open Bible with the Oxwagon and the motto is Dins, which in English is service. service. And in the mid-80s, it, it changed ownership and it became Eaglesville, but they maintained, they kept the badge and the, and the school colors and nothing changed. And it's nice to see the school is well kept. You know, you can see some photos of it, you know, later years. We were mostly Afrikaans-speaking children. Uh, we did have children from English-speaking, well, English Italian, Portuguese people from the parents worked on the Kabora Basa project, um, and quite a fair amount from Zambia. The, the, the parents farmed or, or um, um, worked there. Uh, now, we were, as far as I know, the only school in South Africa that um, followed the South African syllabus, so we had standard six to standard 10 on the trick. And although we... Um, we're mostly Afrikaans speaking children. Our classes were in English. So I've read a lot of times on the um, internet, they say it was the only Afrikaans medium school in the, in, the, in the country, but it was actually English medium school, but Afrikaans speaking children mostly, you know, so. Um, 
then in one of your previous uh, episodes, um, Mike Norton spoke about um, special uh, operation enterprise. And subsequent to that, I found on the internet a write up in much more detail about this by him. And in there, he mentions that at one time they got three, uh, they got reports of three attacks, uh, attacks of three places in Salisbury. One of them, if I remember correctly, was General Walls' house. The other one was a movie theater, and the other one was our school, put us off. Thankfully, that did not materialize. Um, and then something for the Air Force people, Rhodesian Air Force, we had a teacher, Mrs. Durant. Um, her son was a pilot in the Air Force, Randy Durant, and at one time he was the officer commanding of Five Squadron. And if you read um, Wing Commander Pop Gelden, I says book, he, he actually served under him at Five Squadron flying the Canberras. We also, the Falun children, they were one of the first families that were um, the father and mother were killed. Um, I think it was near Hartley, if I remember correctly. Um, they were at school with us. The son and I were actually in the same class um, at school. at Now, we had a very carefree life prior to the war. As you can see, typical farm life, uh, farm life uh, pellet gun, barefoot, never wore shoes, you know, running around, playing with our friends. This is my brother and his friend, Zondi, the son of our tractor driver. Um, and interesting, this dog, a small dog, Smokey, and we had two bigger dogs, but at night during the war, if the other dogs barked, my father would sort of, yeah, listen, but okay, no problem. But when Smokey barked, the smallest dog, then he would pay attention. <laughs> so it was quite ironic. Uh, and we had two big yearly events. One was the Old Year's Eve dance at the Edlands Farmers Hall. And later years, it, it, um, it, there was an alternate venue when the clubhouse was built at um, Inyati Mine. And we had a, there was a farmer from Mayor Rans from Lapis. He had a band and he would play at weddings and sometimes at the Old Year's Eve dance. And there was a song at that time, a very popular, remember the Lions made the hits parade on a Saturday morning, I think at 11 or 11.30. And the song was Love is a Beautiful Song, sang by Dave Mills. I think he was from Australia. So when midnight struck, that song would be played, or if him Lapis was, uh, his band was there, they would sing that song. It became a tradition every year. <laughs> um, and I say it's a dance, but it was actually more like a massive family gathering, you know, because they, yep. you would see farmers that you hadn't seen for a while because they farmed on the other side of Ed Edlands, and it was just a nice family gathering. The other big event was the yearly Gymkhana. It actually started off on uh, the Fisher's farm, and then later it moved to the rifle range just outside Headlands. Now, Steve Murray, one of your previous guests, his father was the cattle manager there, so he lived on the farm. He grew up there for a while. Now, as the war came, obviously, we had to adapt our lives, you know, with the war. My father was like most farmers in the police reserve. And they would do their training at the sometimes at the squash court near at the Nyati mine, the shooting they would do outside the headlands uh, at the rifle range. For us kids, we were very excited because we could pick up the doppies, the empty cartridges. And I had a friend at a classmate at school, Pierre Groovier. He always had these mechanical gadgets and things. So I swapped him once 200 FN doppies for a cannon shell, a big one. <laughs> but my sister, being the oldest, pulled rank and she took it for as an ornament, which is still got to this day. Uh, wow. Yeah. And then in the beginning of the war, my father did do a stint in Hondi Valley. Um, while he was away, my mother and I, we took care of the farm. Um, and, and I think afterwards, they decided it's best to keep the farmers, you know, in their local area. So I, I, he didn't do another stint again. Uh, at that time, when he was away, we had neighbors a few farms away from us, um, um, on Kurt and Tan Mimi, Mimi van Rensburg, and their son, Andres, worked on the mine. So he would come every night and overnight with us. And, you know, that was the nice thing about the farming community. The people were supporting each other and helping each other out. I remember the one case, there was a locust the plague. And my father had the equipment to spray that. But Dainke, our neighbor, didn't have it. So my father went and did it for me. He just gave the diesel, you know. So that's the way it, it, it was like a really a nice bond living in, in, in at that time, which I've never experienced again mm -hmm. and miss it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, as I said, we adapted to the life and just a few points to point out and how we changed and some of them small but important. We obviously always carried a rifle wherever we, we went, the FN or and or the shotgun. We had the agri-alert like all the farms and it was interesting in the beginning when we got it on a Saturday, 
we had an open hour, I think it was about half an hour or an hour where everybody could speak because from the youngest to the oldest I had to learn how to speak on this. So this, these conversations in the open time, <laughs> some funny things coming out there. Now, Lawrence, the just, just, yes. for the, just for the sake of our international views, can you explain what the AgriCalert is, please? The AgriCalert was a radio system uh, because obviously you couldn't rely on the telephone. There's been cases where they, they cut the line. So if you're under attack, you can't phone the police for reaction. So the AgriCalert was a radio system and it, there was a control room at Edlands Police Station in our case, so similar to all the other cases. So that was manned 24 7. So if you had an incident or attack, you would call them on the radio. So, you know, not rely on the telephone, the telephone lines. Yeah. Um, we had the eight feet security fence around the house. You can see the fence, the eight foot with the barbed wire on top. And, and I just want to point out something on the photo, which will come in in a later discussion. You can see, so, so the, our house is to the back of the cameraman. And this is a road that goes down behind my brother downhill. And you can see the white there. There's a start. We've got a store down there. My mother had a store and that's just the roof. And I'll talk about that later. We had sandbags in front of the windows because obviously the farms were attacked, rockets and um, gunfire. And then small measures like, for example, our house was first whitewashed uh, on the outside. So my father changed it to this uh, gray cement colored doll. So if you're walking at night in front of the wall, you're not that visible as compared to the back, the white background. You know, it's a much more contrast. Um, we installed, my father installed lights. It was these tall poles at various positions around the house with floodlights on top. And in the house, we had an electrical cord about a meter long with an electrical plug on one side and a switch on the other side. So if you're under attack, you would just plug that, um, the, put the plug in the socket in the wall, press the switch, which kicks the lights in the house out and these floodlights come on. So you're in dark and, and the attackers are in the light. You know? Yeah. And then the other thing which uh, we also did, and um, before, if my parents went to town, before we drove out to the farm, they would go to the owner of Edlands Hotel. You can see the photo here, Mr. De Freitas at that time, and tell them, tell him, listen, we're leaving for the farm now. If we don't call you in whatever it was, 45 minutes, please send out the police. You know, those were days before the phone. So you had uh, cell phones or you had to make other plans. Uh, then we also had what we call a green route, which was a backup route. And just to illustrate that, you can see this is the map and uh, the blow up here. I'll, I'll show that shortly. Um, get down. This is our house. This is Ndainke from the Space House. And this is the main road. So what my father and Ndainke did was make a back road here. So, you know, if this was taken out by a landmine or whatever the case might be, you got this back, back route, which we call the green route. Right. Well, as kids, we were crazy about that because we could visit each other, the friends on the farm, neighboring farm, and we were not allowed to drive on the main road because we didn't have licenses. Yeah. I actually one day went on the road and the police van came past and I got such a fright, I went off into the contours instead <laughs> of just going on. <laughs> the guy turned around, he came, but he had this smile. I, I can't, his first name was Don. He was a very tall guy, like six foot seven, the policeman. I think he became member in charge later in Inyanzura or one of those areas. And he looked at me, you know, suppressing his smile and said, have you got a license? I said, no. He said, well, you shouldn't be driving here. So I got a big fright. Um, <laughs> that was the so freedom we enjoyed in that country. It was wonderful. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, landmines were actually one of our, uh, were one of our biggest fears. So, mm -hmm. you know, whenever you're driving, you would look for if there's any disturbance of the road. And also you would look for, young trees that's been snapped up, maybe it's two thirds up the way, the top part hanging down, because that was sometimes used to indicate to the locals where the landmines were planted. So, and Tony, as, as I said, with the war coming, the, not only the farmers didn't only have to contend to the war, but they still had to keep on farming and which included looking after their um, employees, you know, um, uh, one case I remember very clearly was the our the worker who looked after the cattle, Andrea, came and reported to my dad that he had found Gaetano, which was our garden worker, had hung himself up in a tree. And if you look at the map, this is our farm's boundary. It was here in the southern part, very uh, remote part. We didn't get there often. And and just by the way, this farm here belonged to our neighbor to the south was Johannes Martins, and I'll speak about more about him later. So, you know, the question is now, is this is a setup? Or is this for real? But my father had to go and check it out. So he took the necessary precautions, like, for example, not approaching from the expected direction. 
uh, on the one, th one hand, thankfully, it was still a way out when he smelled the body. So the, the body was they had been hanging for a few days, but sadly, the Gaetano had killed himself. Um, mm -hmm. And then another time where the farmers were very uh, exposed and susceptible to the ambush was the tobacco curing time. Uh, it, it was very important to keep the curing temperature at the correct temperature. So we had uh, two workers, one working day shift, shift and the other one night shift. Um, but during the night, he would wake up two or three times. He had this big alarm clock, you know, with a, you, had, you wound it up. And so he would go, but that, go and check the temperature. So he, that meant he had to go outside the security fence, mm -hmm. which left him very exposed, similar to the other farmers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in the in the barn in that area, it's very um, confined quarters, ideal place for an ambush, you know. I mean, they can even be waiting in an empty barn and, and come out, you know. So yeah. thankfully, by the grace of God, that never happened, you know, that he was in an ambush, but it, it was a very dangerous time for all farmers, you know, that was in that situation. Um, now, just to give you a, a feel for the lay of the land where we found, you, we had two TTLs near us. The one was Waya TTL, which was directly north to our farm, Yamangura. You can see here's in Yati mine. And then northeast, we had Tanda uh, TTL. So if you took the road from Headlands and you go this way, you, you, on this road, you get to Waya and then Maya Ranch. And you can even go all the way to Matoko. We, in the earlier days, we used to take that back road to visit my parents, friends, and Bob and uh, Tani Dolores Ru in Matoko. Then there was a turn of year, which this road looped back to the, this road here. And then you had the second turn off, which went all the way to Tanda. And if you turn off here, you went to Inyati mine, um, just to get a feel of the area. So we were, our area were bounded by, on this side, the boundaries formed by the two TTLs. Um, and, and Tony, as I mentioned previously, Inyati mine was very important to us for various reasons. One of them being the mine workers were on the in the police reserve and they, there was always a team on standby. So they would, if there was an attack or an incident, they would respond in their leopard, that uh, landmine protected vehicle. Oh. And, and for us, as you can see, um, you know, in Yati mine is here, our farm is here, it's very close. It's much closer than this distance here. So we, we had the benefit of a quick response. I think it was maybe 15, 20 minutes drive, as I mentioned previously. Zooming, you can see it's basically just across the Maratsi River. Um, so that was very beneficial to us. Um, um, there was a go, lot. Before you go any further, um, this uh, Puki there, that vehicle, might be a name and a vehicle that our foreign listeners are not aware of. It was based on um, a VW chassis, if I'm correct. Yes, it yes, was yes that's developed yeah. entirely in, in Rhodesia. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, South African Rhodesia actually set the precedent for making these of uh, these mine proofed MRAP vehicles, you know, with the V shaped yeah, hull, yeah. and indeed yeah. still exports them from South Africa. So at the back there would be a VW engine, and the idea was that uh, it would go down the road and detect mines with a, a, a platform either side of it in the middle. And um, if, if it hit a mine, well, the little cage would roll over and, and the driver would be safe. And that was proven many times. Um, a very, very efficient little vehicle. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, usually in a, in a convoy, like for example, the Mayor Ranch farmers, they had a turret time. So, you know, they would lead out with a pookie, you know, to clear the mine, as you said. And, and but this one is also the one in the picture here is the leopard, which carried, uh, um, uh, uh, which carried uh, um, uh, people. I think it was. That apart from a driver, there was maybe another five people it could carry at least four, you know, like a stick type thing. Yeah. Um, so they had one of these which they would react to. The other, um, we had a big, there was a big, a massive transport truck. And this truck would transport the copper from Inyati mine to Headlands from where it was railed off to wherever they processed the copper. So this passed by multiple times in front of our house, you know, the road from Headlands. So it was like a protection mechanism against mines, and it's very important to us. There was obviously also a chopper fuel at Inyati mine, and interesting years later, when I was in the SAF, I was speaking to a colleague and telling him where we left and everything, and I mentioned Inyati mine. He said, oh, I know Inyati mine. I refueled there a time or two. He was a chopper pilot, which did uh, tours in Rhodesia. 
So it was nice to talk about him. And him and his wife recently went on tour, you know, these camping, and they actually passed by that area. Uh, nice. We also had a butchery. It was owned by Uncle William Finity, and we always had bulk on. Very cheap, very Lovely. good. Um, and a supermarket by uh, owned by Uncle Don and Auntie Ann Cooks. Uh, I think later years, they, when they moved from Inyati Mine, they had the spa in Rusapi. Um, now, the incident uh, started increasing, especially when uh, Mozambique was handed over to, um, uh, power was handed over to Frilimo. So you can see there, one incident was a landmine, which is an RAR truck, which detonated the man mine. And this farm here to the north belonged to Ndanki and Tanihina van Espai, which I mentioned previously. And this truck detonated the landmine here, very close to their house. And you can see Uncle Stan Baker, our neighbor to directly to the east, uh, that he farmed on Riswert, yeah, and the Marathi Dam was on his farm. You can see him here in the hole and the soldiers in the back. Um, there. Um, then and and the, that was in a, the army four five is that right? I, I, four and a half times? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think it was the one in the back. The yeah, back something. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this this was taken the next day, you know. So, the, right. so yeah, I think it was a four five. It, it, uh, from what I remember, there were quite a big contingent of uh, RAR operating in that area towards Waya, you know, in 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 that um, area. Mm. Uh, so that was one incident. Um, then. Um, there was a farm, if I remember correctly, it was Bryden, and that was owned by Uncle Dennis and Auntie Kathy Bagnall. Um, Uncle Dennis had a nice motorboat, which he kept at the jetty at in Marazzi Dam, and we always used to look with big eyes at this boat. <laughs> um, and he was ambushed and killed on his farm. So really, you know, um, all these killings shook a community. You know, it was it was really bad for the community, but you still had to go on. Now, the neighboring farm belonged to him simply from Black, and I'll get back to him later. In, in the same time, more or less, when Uncle Dennis was killed on his farm, there was another farm of Jan Strado. Now, he's, he farmed, I don't know exact farm, but in this area, in the Rathcline area. And his wife and children lived on the um, Inyati mine because of the danger of the farm, and he was also killed on his farm. Um, his daughter, by the way, um, Estelle, is married to Andres, the guy who used to come in overnight when, when my father was away on that stint in, in Hondi Valley when I mentioned him previously. So that, like I said, all these farmers and I, you know, in my small way, also want to mention them as a way of a tribute because uh, um, it, it was devastating to the community. But, you know, you still have to just put your head down and go. You know. Looking at the map, it's very much um, an Afrikaans area. Uh, looking oh, at the yeah, name, yeah. the names of the farms, Veltrefreda, um, yeah, yeah, more of it, all Ritfle, all those that was very much yeah, an Afrikaans yeah. community, v very much so. I, I think in our direct community, the only English one we had was Uncle Stan, which was he, and he found on this was the very Afrikaans, <laughs> <laughs> and then Uncle Dennis Bagnall, you know, on, on here. Yeah. Um, most of them because all the others, um, Ben from Mielen, um, Dainke, um. Yanni van der most Afrikaans-speaking people. Yeah. Why, why did they all end up in that area? Was it some place the Ford Trek is headed for at some point? I, I'm not sure, but I know, for example, this farm, Trelawney, that belonged to, uh, not to, uh, yeah, Trelawney belonged to Nghil and Tani um, Elise Smuts. Libertas is the um, um, Kurt and Tani Mimi van Rensburg, which was Andres's parents. And our farm belonged to uh, Uncle Jeff and Tani Drisa Edwards. And all those, the wives were sisters. So they inherited this farm from their, from their parents. Uh, you know, so I, I think it must be, you know, a few generations back when they came and settled there. It's the yep. same. I, th I think this, it's either Claremont or here. There was um, Isaac van Amerwe. Now his son, um, Yanni, was our neighbor directly to the west. His other son, um, Saki, which I'm going to talk about, owned this farm, Aruma. And Mfans, his other son, had a farm just off the map, which you cannot see here. So there was also, I think, in the way back in the days, like because there were quite a few pioneering, like the, the Martin track, you know, that Martinez Martin, he was a descendant of the Martin track that moved to Rhodesia and established these farms. You know, they got oh. the farms from, I think they bought it from Cecil John Rhodes or whoever was in charge at that time. And then it was, you know, handed over to their descendants. Mm -hmm. Interesting. In any case, so uh, now our neighbor directly to the 
to the west, Umjani van the Merle, or, you know, that I just mentioned previously. They were directly to the west of us. And at one time, there was a lone lion roaming through this area. So one day, his worker came and reported that he'd seen Spook very close to their houses here, um, very close to their house. So he went to have a look. They followed the spur. It was at the foot of a kopi, a small hill. So he um, followed the spur for a while and then went back um, home. A few days later, a stick patrolled that area and came through, and they started ascending the kopi. And when before they got to the crest, just before they got over the crest of the kopi, one of the stick members, I, I can't remember exactly whether he got nervous or he heard something, and he started firing. And as they came over the crest, they just saw Turs running. So that was a temporary base camp. Mm -hmm. And there was a large number of them there. Um, so the, the fact that he started firing early actually saved their lives. They would have walked slap bang into that base. And, and a while ago, I spoke to Dries, who's Umyani and Tanimari's son. And he said that day he had a friend visiting there and they went with his dad and they followed the spoor and they got bored and turned around. If they kept on walking, they would actually walk into the base camp. Wow. So, you know, so this is another aspect of the war, you know, on the farm, you, you were always alert and expecting an ambush or expecting attack on the house or whatever. But I don't think we always fully realized the, the, how, how grave the danger was, you know, I, I mean. I, I think all of us were given a sixth sense. I, I, can, yeah. I can name two occasions on active duty where that my sixth sense saved my life. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's almost like a spiritual thing. Yeah, 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 no, true. So um, that was one incident. We had an incident on our farm. Um, and then just before I get into that, just to give you a, a layout which plays into the story. So this is the road to Headlands and Inyati Mine. So we had a road that came past here from the main road. And there was another one from my house to here. That's maybe 100 meters, if not even that far. And then here was a store. My mother had a store on the farm. And in the back of the store, there were... Um, living quarters and Nesbitt and his wife, our storekeeper, lived there. And then this road goes up a hill, you know, maybe uh, 70 meters or so hill, and then you get into our house. Um, and you can see the security fence, the house. We had a shed here with the barns, a shed and then the barns. And here was a wild fig tree, old wild fig tree. And my father had hung up a disc, a plow disc on a piece of wire, and we had a bolt, we which we hit that was our clock, our bell to call the workers to report in the morning and, and after um, lunch, uh, very effective. Uh, just a little bit more information. This is the reservoir. This is a photo, uh, the Google as it looks today. So I'm just superimposing on you just to give you a feel for the story coming up. You can see here's the reservoir. Now, if you look in this direction from that side to here, this is the photo that you see here. And you can see the reservoir here in the corner. Um, just to give you a feel of how it looked, this is my mother's, we call it in Afrikaans, Rotstein. I think it's a terrace, uh, maybe garden. And then if you look in from the house towards this, this is the view you see here, you know, the shed on the, the side and the, yep. the starting of the shed with the gate. So we were home from a boarding school. It was Sunday evening. We were going back to school the next morning. We were all in bed, except my father and sister were having a chat. I think it was about eight o'clock at night. And suddenly this bell goes off. Somebody's hitting the bell. I got a massive fright. <laughs> Hit the deck, started praying profusely. And my first thought was, these terrorists are mocking us before they can attack us. You know. <laughs> so okay. After a while, nothing happened. And my father made the way out um, and he made contact. And it was actually Nesbitt that rang the bell, you know, the clock bell. So what had happened, the terrorists had come to the store. Now, bear in mind, from the store to the house, I don't think it's even 200 meters, but fortunately, the store was out of sight, in line of sight, because it's down the hill. Yeah. So they had come to, to the store, broken it up, uh, open, uh, and stole goods for them. By that time, my mother had called the control room, and the um, guys, the police reservists, reacted in their leopard, rushed to the scene. And... Um, they swept through here, but but that time they'd gone already. So so thankfully, they didn't attack us. They just broke in and stole the stuff. Now, the, the tail end to this was when my mother claimed from the insurance, they said, no, this is not a robbery. So <laughs> yeah, she had struggled getting the insurance to pay out the, the claim. Um, now, this this year is from Ati Kraus. Um, now, him and his wife, Tani Max Kraus, farmed here on this farm, Bunzina. Just to give you orientation, our farm is here. 
And this is Umsimpi van Black, and I'll talk more about him later. But this photo, by the way, was taken on this farm, Kopi Alien, which belonged to Mani and Stanislav Kloppers, which people will know from that area. And it was taken at one of their daughter's wedding, which the reception was on the farm. So this is the photo here. Now, Ati had a brother, Umkwis, and, and his wife, Tani Jeanette, they farmed here. And I think they were twin brothers, if I could remember correctly. But every morning, they would call each other, and they would talk for like an hour. Um, and they just talk. And the one morning, Mati was talking when a bus came by on the road here from the way on my own side, detonated the landmine in front of the house. So if he didn't do that, that call that day, he would have um, been killed in that landmine, most probably. Wow. So you could have said he missed the landmine, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's providence. Yeah, and then we had an incident on the 11th of uh, January 78, but first... Just to mention, uh, as I said, our farm was here. The Chenika and St. Jenna farm were owned by Dankin, Tanina van Rensburg. And this farm, Welterfriede, was owned by Umben and Tani Anni van Meerlen. The neighboring farm belonged to Umsaki and Tani Anna van um, um, And uh, as I mentioned, Umsaki was a brother of our neighbor to the to the east, Um Yanni van Meerlen. Now, a few months earlier, to uh, from 11 January, um, Saki, Tani, Anna, and the two children were coming home from a weekend when they detonated the landmine. Mm. If I remember correctly, the little boy was flung out of the car, out of the jeep. They had a land rover. Fortunately, it was a landmine protected land rover. They all survived. And then they decided, decided to um, vacate the farm. So um, Ben was leasing this farm from um, um, Saki. Mm. Now, on the 11th of January, they took their son, Villa, to Headlands um, to drop him off. He was studying in South Africa, so he got a lift back to um, South Africa. But a month earlier, Villa arrived from South Africa on the holiday in, in the early December, and he went that night to close the gates, and he couldn't see the dogs. They were not anywhere to be seen. So he thought they were maybe just in another part of the fence. And that night, Ben was taking a bath, and he was a bit hard hearing, so he heard this tuk tuk sound, and he thought it was maybe, the, you know, that time it was raining season, so the beetle, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, fly towards the light and they fly into the window. Mm. And as him then got up, he just felt these bullets flying past, so they were under attack, the house were attacked. And one of the bullets still took the fridge out. <laughs> so they, I mean, it's a fridge. We went to visit the next morning, the, the bathroom inside were full of bullet holes, I still dug a one of the bullet the tips out, out of the wall. But back to the 11th of, of January. So after dropping off their son, they went about doing their business and, and Ben still went to an auction and won a pumpkin, a big pumpkin in a raffle. It was in one of the local newspapers. And then they made their way back to the farm. <clears throat> um, now, it was about three, four o'clock that afternoon and Uncle Stan and Auntie Bob's, our neighbors, uh, directly to the uh, east of us and farmed on Riswood. And their son, Anthony, who was in the, doing national service, I think he's on the RRI and eventually in St. Louis Scouts. They were visiting there when we heard Tani Ani call on the Agri-Alert and she called the police station saying that her husband, at Ben, had gone to the lands to pick up the workers because they were working on the, yeah, on, on the neighboring farm that he was leasing. And she heard gunshots. So um, Uncle Stan and um, Anthony rushed there. And a while later, the police reserves came by, by from Inyati mine. Um, and I remember um, after the, the Tani Ani had called, you know, the police station, the Agri Alert, my mother called her on the phone, you know, to support her. And my mother came back and said, um, Tani Ani said that um, she know he's not coming back. And he was killed in the ambush. So, yeah. so we... Yeah. we um, uh, my father, Uncle Stan, Anthony, we, we went to visit the Amish site the next day. And, and if you look at their houses here, um, and if you blow this part here, um, superimposed here, the house was here. There was a stream here. And that time the road went from here and the, on the other side. And about here was the ambush site. And it was it made like a 90 degree turn here, near 90 degree, not as, as shown on the, on the Google extract here. Mm -hmm. So we arrived there next day at the scene. The, the It was raining season and the grass was at least knee high. You mm -hmm. know? So it was lush bush. And the, the road might have to the left. 
And um, just after the, about two thirds, I, I say a road, it was the square score plus bike is the two track farm roads, you know, and the grass was tall. So you cannot drive fast. You know, you have to even, you have to slow down to make the turn. And the buckley came to a stop just past the anthill. Now this anthill that was very close to the um, buckley, where the bucky would pass, maybe from the tip, the top of the anthill, it was maybe a meter, if that far. Uh, on the back of the bucky, we found, found a piece of bone, and it was a chunky piece of bone, because on the back of the bucky were the nine or 11 workers that Ben went to pick up. So somebody was wounded, and it looked like a piece out of the shin bone. And um, the behind the anthill was a lot of AK doppies. So one of the ambushes must have been behind the this anthill, and he, he basically shot in Ben at point blank range, you know, close to sticking the barrel into the um, cabin. We found in Ben's watch on the floor because one of the bullets had shot off his strap and it fell on the floor. And then worst of all, on the, um, in the bucket on the front was a small note. It was a piece of paper torn out. And on the paper was written, you white pigs, Zano will win. Um, so it, it, you know, all these farmers being killed, it was really devastating. You know, it, it was, um, it, it, it really knocked the community. But as I said, you had to keep going. Now, our neighbor directly to the south of us here, um, this farm here was Johannes Martins. Now his wife and children lived in Rusapi because of the danger of the farm. And my first suit I ever, she worked at Edgar's in Rusapi, and the first suit I ever got, my, it, I think it was in Standard 7, my, that would be Form 2, I, I think. Um, my mother bought it, it was this Rhodesian green suit. And man, I thought I was the cat's whiskers to have a suit, and especially in the Rhodesian colors. <laughs> I actually wore it to my um, matric farewell. So he would farm in the week and go home in the weekends. And coming back one weekend from the farm, they were waiting for him at his house. And they abducted him and took him to Mozambique. Um, and he was released in, in 1979. His daughter actually wrote a book, Abducted by Terrorist. Um, and, and that, Tony, I mean, all the farmers being killed was a big shock. But this was now a new threat dimension because you didn't know what would happen if they would take you to, to Mozambique or, or abduct you? You didn't know what would happen. So that, that was also a big impact. Now, coming back to Umsimpi, uh, yeah, uh, the other gentleman on the photo. Now, Umsimpi and Tani Mims, they owned the farm here and they farmed with their son, Espia, and his wife, Gerda. So when Umhanis was abducted, Espia was called up as part of the follow-up operations. And while he was gone, Umsimpi, uh, Gerda, the uh, SP and Gerda's daughter, and she was pregnant with a second child. They went to Nyati mine, and on the way back, they detonated the landmine, and all of them were killed in one. Oh. So, so this this was a, a terrible blow for the community. Oh. I, I mean, even anyone killing Ben, everybody was really bad, but this was like a, a, um, yeah. a lot of things at one time. Terrible. Now, Lonely Dale, as you can see on Lonely Dale, there's a T junction here. Uh, when my father left Lonely Dale, it was bought by Chris and Tani Thelma Stein. And I spoke to their son, um, um, though, uh, a while ago, and he said his father on that day was on the way to the to the fields to feed the cattle when he saw him simply drive past on the road back to his farm. And a short while later, landmine went off. So, so very, very devastating for us. Um, now, another incident, um, as I said, on Dainkin Tani Ina, they owned this farm, uh, these two farms. So they went on holiday to South Africa once. So they asked um, Ivan and Tani Mari, tenant who lived on the mine, in Yati mine, um, Ivan um, worked there. Their son, Martin, and I were friends. Uh, Martin would come and visit a lot of times with his pump action shotgun. So we had good funds like, you know, putting salt in the, the bullet and shooting that. And you see this nice blue flame coming out. You know, so, um, so every night, um, 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 Danky left his... Um, OJ for um, Ivan and Tani Mari, and every night after work, they would drive there, check out the farm, and overnight at the farm. This one particular night, as they got into the OJ, Tani Mari slammed the hand in the door, and that was a heavy door, you know, so she had to go to the sick bay to get treatment. Yeah. As it turned out, that saved their lives, because the terrorists were waiting for them at the gate. So when they did not come, they went down to the compound, which you can see is here, the houses where the workers lived. Yeah. Now, later that night, my 
parents were preparing to come to school the next day to visit us. And my father heard this crunching sound. And we had a boor bulldog. This thing would get hold of anything and chew it, you know. So it sounded like he had a piece of cardboard or something. And my parents' uh, room in the house faced towards um, Dainke's farm. And so he did the usual drill, you know, close the door. Uh, that's something else I should mention. I forgot to mention previously. Whenever we heard something outside, there was you would close the door of that room, switch off the light, and then open the curtains. You know, you don't just open the curtains in the light and make a target of yourself. And that was so drawing to us that for me, if I nowadays drive through a, a, a neighborhood and I see people got their curtains or their um, uh, blinds open, it's wrong <laughs> because it was so thrilling to us. In any case, my father opened the curtain and he, so he's looking now towards from our house towards from Dainke's farm and he just saw the whole sky lit up. Oh. And what had happened after they'd gone down to the to the workers' houses, they burned down the houses. Oh. And you know, that, that was another sad part of the, the, I mean, they lost, these workers lost everything, you know, apart from the intimidation and the fear that they have to go through. Yeah. So very sad, you know, and a lot of times I think of them also that, that really, you know, yeah. were caught between the two ends and, and even on experiencing something like that. It's, it's really bad. Just lovely. Um, Most of them were just. Yeah, lovely. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then um, we had an incident one day. We were home from school and we were standing at our um, at the barns. And from where we stood, it looked like it was in this area. There was a fire force deck circling. It was over more or less over Ben's farm from where we stood. We could also hear the K-car firing. So there was obviously a contact going on. We couldn't see the, the K-car. And the next day we heard, we got news that Lord Sissel was killed in that contact. Oh, yes. Yeah. And if you go to uh, Beaver Shaw's book, Chopper Tech, by the way, excellent book. Really good. Oh, um, on, from page 174. He gives a lot of information and background to that contact in which Lord Cecil was killed. And there's actually a video where um, him and his um, colleague, Nick Downey, they made it. You can see the contact where they carry um, soldiers that were killed, um, RR oh, soldiers. That's right. And he's helping them carry. And there's a caption that says a week later after this video Lord Cecil was killed in, in the in that contact. Yes, I've seen that um, video. Yeah. Then our in the mid yeah, yeah. In the mid 78s, um they blocked the Marachi Bridge. Now as I said, the, the Marachi Marachi um bridge is here just downstream of the dam. And that was a link be between us and Inyati mine, very important. And I would say that was the straw that broke the uh, back the uh, camel's back because now we lost all the security offered by Inyati mine, as I discussed earlier. Now our yeah. first reaction was from source, uh, sorry, headlands about four times further and longer, and that big truck, you know, that was yeah. passing in front of us. So my parents decided to um, rent a house in Salisbury um, because we were still at school, but he stayed behind on the farm to harvest the crops um, and pack up the farm. He had to go and hire three guards, guards at great expenses. There was companies that offered that service. Mm -hmm. And um, and the day, you know, the day my mother left for, for Salisbury, it was very sad because she and one of the workers in the house, Eunice, they were crying and hugging oh. each other, you know. And Eunice was the wife of our one of our tractor drivers, Francis. So very, very, very sad. Uh, but just to give a bit more detail of the bridge. So if you look at the zoom in here, you come from Nauti Mine, and there's flat ground here. You go over the bridge. It's a fairly high bridge, one-way bridge. And then there's a steep hill. It's a, maybe 150, 100 meters. And on each side, there was a large embankment. Um, so if, with the cars of that time, if you made it at 40 kilometers an hour up that hill, you're doing very good. So you're sitting, mm -hmm. basically sitting duck. And mm -hmm. after the bridge was blown, they actually swept the area, and they found that these guys had been lying up here. They found 17 places. So they estimated a team of 17. And, you know, everybody, my father, the other farmers, the truck, everybody were passing by here, and they were just lying here looking at, uh, again, you know, not, we knew there were danger, but I don't think we always realized how grave the danger yeah. was, you know. Yeah. yeah. Horrific. Yeah. So my father moved the equipment from headlands um sold the two headlands sold the cattle and the day he left the farm i still went to on holidays to the farm 
And it was, you know, while he was harvesting the crop and packing up and it was, the house was empty. There were no curtains. He had just Hessian bags in front of the curtains, uh, the windows. So it was really, you know, you, you, you knew what it was and what it was now. You know, it, it was sad. It was very, very bad. Um, but, you know, the, it, so the day we left the farm was a very, very sad day. Um, because, you know, we and the workers, it, we nearly like family because you shared yeah. your lives on the farm. Yeah. You went through the good times, the bad times, happy yeah. times, sad times. So it, it it's you, it's not like you cannot be affected. It's it's like a family. You know, you have your arguments and you have your good times, you know. And and one of the incidents, a funny one I remember was, this is Kandoto, one of our tractor drivers. And he one time had too much of the Doro, the beer. Mm. And he caused some problems with his wife. But his wife was bigger than him, not fat. She was just bigger. Um, and she sorted it out very quickly. So he became the laughing stock of the other workers. So he never <laughs> tried that again. <laughs> um, but one of the sad incidences was, and I remember this vividly, um, was Takawara, one of our tractor drivers. Him and his wife had a young baby girl, not even three months old. And I remember it was a Saturday and she was very sick, this baby. So my father drove through to, took her to, to, through to the Sapi hospital. Mm. And the doctor said, this baby is critical. If she's not admitted immediately, she's going to die. Sorry. And the mother refused. She said, no, she will take her to the witch doctor. Oh. So we, we spend a long time, the nurses, the doctors, everybody trying to convince her, please let your baby be taken up in hospital for treatment. Yeah. She said no. So eventually we had to leave. leave. We drove back and I remember sitting there looking at the baby and she did not look good. And I realized this baby could be dead by the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And that afternoon, five, six o'clock, the baby was dead. She took her to the witch doctor, but nothing else. So, yeah. so she did. So very, very sad. Mm -hmm. uh, another sad and good uh, case was the hangar, our worker in the house. His wife had a... Um, twin daughters and apparently there's some other traditional belief that he has to kill the second daughter my father stopped my father stopped him in time so my father basically saved the, the, the girl's life she grew up to be a, um, a young woman when by the time we left so you know th those are the type of things you went through so it's 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 not something that's trivial you know mm -hmm. it affects you your person a lot and then this worker, this was very sad also. This worker here, his name was Window. And yeah. my father was giving away stuff when he was, you know, uh, cleaning up the farm. And and yeah. Window, he wanted to give him stuff. And Window said, he said, thank you very much. I appreciate your offer. But he said, but what do I do with this? I said, I've got nowhere to go. I've got no job. My my, mm -hmm. uh, you, you at least can move somewhere and carve out a new life. Yes, you've lost everything. And that that really hit home, apart from all the others. But you know, the again the 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 bad situation that they were in, the innocent, you know, because we had a yeah, good, good bunch, really of people. And then '79, my father spent uh, selling the farm equipment from Edlands and arranging to move to South Africa. Um, yes, so on the 31st of uh, January 1980, we left Salisbury for Fort Victoria. We, we overnighted at friends in the Morgan Star Mission Station. And the next morning, we got the convoy to Bitebridge. Uh, do you guys remember all the convoys and the yeah, Rockies, yeah. the patrol? Yeah. Yeah. And we were in between Bitebridge and Fort Victoria. when. Uh, so, so my father, maybe I should first say, my father was driving a, a car. We had a PJ 404 station wagon. Uh, with a small trailer behind, accompanied by my brother. I was driving the bucky with my mother, accompanying me with also with the trailer behind. My sister was in Cape Town studying. And we're in this, in the middle of these two towns when the car pulled up behind, it's next to my father and showed him there's something wrong. So in the convoy, so we pulled off. It turned out that the trailer's one wheel had come off. Uh, one of the buckies um, stopped. They said, we cannot stay with you. We have to leave. So there we are on our own. Thankfully, these, because, you know, here we were, we, my father had given the FN back. So all we had was our personal weapons, which was the semi-automatic shotgun, the .303 and .22 on it. Thankfully, these two guys stayed with us. And they must have been either national service or territorial because they had their webbing with the magazines and mm -hmm. the uh, FN. Wow. Then second problem we ran into, my father got a spare wheel from somebody about a year earlier. He took that off to put it on the wheel that's lost. <laughs> and the holes in the rim would not align with the bolts in the hub. <laughs> so it couldn't <laughs> fit. So thankfully, these two guys drove back and they found the wheel about a half a kilometer later. So we 
Good. We put the wheel back on and they stayed with us. And we arrived obviously much later than the convoy in, in um, Whitebridge. And I, we, we were forever thankful. We'll be thankful to these guys. I wish one day I can speak to them again. So if they're perhaps listening on this channel, it, if they were, the, it was, they drove a Datsun 120Y. And mm -hmm. um, two guys, uh, please let me know. I would like to thank you again. So we arrived on the South African side, and as of the 1st of um, um, February, they, they had increased the tax, or the import tax on your, the second car. I can't remember, I just knew, uh, something like 115% of the current market value stuck in my head. Oh. So at that time, when you immigrated, you could only take $1,000 per family out, but if you went on holiday, it was $600 per family member. So the year before we went on holiday, um, and on the way back, my father cashed in all the travelers' check and left some money, the rest of the money with Msaki from America, the one I spoke about earlier. They were living in Lutrichat at that time. Right. So when we got there, this was devastating because this is the money my father had put aside to, to you know, take care of us until he get a job. So we had to call Msaki to go and get the money and bring it to us. Um, so we waited for him. Um, to come and I must say, if ever I saw a devastated man, it was my father that day. He was just he just sat there. He, he, you know, I, you, you get a lot of time these comics when a guy is totally deflated, he just yeah. flops down like this, like a piece of paper. And that was him. Uh, he yeah. just sat there, broken. And eventually, Msaki arrived. We we you know that boom that you drove through to yeah. South Africa. He handed the money over the boom. It was nearly like a drug deal or something going on over the boom. <laughs> so we paid and. We left by about four o'clock that afternoon, so we'd been at there from one o'clock um, with all these problems, and we were maybe not even ten minutes into South Africa when my father stopped. So Msaki is now following us in his car, and he pulled off the road, and we pulled off, and he got out, and he looked terrible. He had a rash, he was swollen, and my father never ever ever got a headache, and that day with all the stress he got a headache, and my mother gave him a discipline, and we did not know he was allergic to that. So he really looked bad. So we waited there for a while, and after a while, it got better. And then we made our way to with Trichot. We overnighted with them, Saki and and Tani Anna. I'm very thankful for them. You know, the sport without them, uh, I don't know what we would have done. Yeah. And and you know that ended our first day in Rhodesia. But Tony, you know, many days I think about you know we as a family lost. My father lost basically everything, but there were people that lost much more worse off than we. I think about even the people in Angola that left with the clothes on their body, Mozambique. And, and I always think about that. And all of us lost um, friends in the war mm -hmm. and a lot of people lost family. Now, we as a family were, were very blessed in that we came out of that war intact. Although we lost everything, we were still very, very blessed. And by the grace of God, we we could still be alive. You know, And I think of the people that lost family and friends. It's it's It must be really bad you know, for them. In terrible, case, uh, terrible loss, my friend. Terrible, yeah. terrible. So the next day, this is now post Rhodesia. We made our way to Cape Town. We stayed with my father's uh, brother and, and wife, uncle, and aunt. Very thankful for them to put up a family. Now, at that time, I was in um, um, my final school year. I'd missed about a month of schooling, so I urgently had to get into the school. My my father, uh, parents decided to put me in the boarding school. Um, in Paul Russ in Stellenbosch. And then I ran into another problem because the, the math course, the standard nine and 10 math course, uh, in um, math in um, South African syllabus run as one course. So they've got half, half algebra, half geometry in standard nine and the other half in standard 10. So in Rhodesia, or in Botasov, although we followed the same syllabus, we did half, half um, algebra in standard nine and the other half in matric while or worse, they did all the algebra and standard nine and all the uh, geometry matrix. So I had to catch up this half. The fact that I was ahead on geometry meant nothing. So they were good. They gave me a teacher, uh, uh, excellent uh, teacher uh, classes um, after school. And by the end of the year, I passed matric with a uh, university exemption by the grace of God. I wanted to go and study, but no, no money. So I went to work for a year and then started studying mechanical engineering. Um, I, while studying, I found out that you could actually study through the Air Force, engineering through the Air Force, which is a, it was a good deal because they paid you a salary, and you got a, um, um, uh, they paid your class fees. Mm. So, in the meantime, my siblings and I become um, South African citizens. So when I was called up for national service in '83, I decided to interrupt my studies. Money was also running low. Mm -hmm. 
I was called up to the army, um, did my basics, and then the next year I joined the SAF. Um, so before studying, I first had to go and do an officer's course at the Air Force College. Um, and I must tell you about an incident. Um, it, we had this week of exercises in the bush in the Waterberge, the water mountains uh, near uh, uh, Wombath, north of Pretoria. And we up and down in the mountains. And on the Thursday, the DSS, the directing staff, told us, we can leave stuff on the truck. We can decide what we want to carry for that day. But there's no guarantee when we're getting it back. So most of us just took food and water. And we were heading to our position. It was late afternoon. For the position for the night, it was late afternoon. And we walked through this mini field. Food was running low. And it was winter time, so the minis were dry. And so I think back to the farm. The, the workers used to take these dry minis and peel them off the cob and roast them on a plate over a fire. So I thought they called it Maputi. Yeah. So I thought, what I'll do is I'll 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 borrow two uh, millies from the farmers on a non-returnable basis. We go, and then so we got there for the night. Uh, it was dark already. When we got there. And I took my dicks out and started roasting my millies. Now these guys were standing there, the other course mates, looking at me very skeptical. What are you doing? So I explained to them, you know, I learned this from the workers in Rhodesia, and I love it. It's very nice. So when it was ready, there was sort of apprehension. The second I taste, I said, sure. They loved it so much. They polished it. I didn't, I don't think I had, if I had, it was very little. So <laughs> kudos to the recipe of the, <laughs> the farm workers. It was internationally acclaimed. Basically. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So they, then I completed my studies. I went to work at the mechanical engineering office as Air Logistics Command. And speaking about that, one of my colleagues, he was in a different um, department, the Sigun okay. Um that, that spoke about... Um, this incident now, I remember him telling us about this contact. And he said when they came back, they had something like 124 bullets hole through the helicopters. But he, but he never told us the background. So it was so nice listening to fighting men of Rhodesia and closing the loop. And, you yeah. know, there he mentioned about the 50 bullet holes just in the cockpit area. So that was really nice, you know, to <laughs> listen yeah. to them. Um, then after a while working in the engineering office, I was uh, selected to go on the graduate experimental flight test course as a, a flight test engineer at the National Test Pilot School in they based in Mojave, California. Yeah. At that time, only one of five recognized schools in the world that trained test pilots and uh, flight test engineers. The others was ETPS, Empire Test Pilot School in the UK, Airplane France, US Navy and the US Air Force. So after graduating as a flight test engineer, I was posted to the Test Flight and Development Center, or TFDC, outside Bredastorp. Now, TFDC is, is just outside Bredastorp, between Bredastorp and Arniston. And Bredastorp is about 190 kilometers southeast of Cape Town and about 30, 35 kilometers north of Alcalas, which is the most southern tip of Africa. So um, a lot of people think that two oceans meet at Cape Point. Yeah, it's actually at Alcalas, which is the most southern tip of Africa. Um, now, the neighboring town was Napier, yeah, and Pico van der Beel and his family farmed outside Napier. Napier. We, we saw them on the beach at, at um, Barnes Grounds on a Sunday, uh, just close next to Arniston. Uh, the wife and children were playing around in their wetsuit, and he was walking in his jacket and tie, very formal. <laughs> <laughs> he now, was a great uh, character, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going I in actually, hot, hot pursuit, hot pursuit. Yeah. 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 When I saw him on the beach afterwards, I, I regret I didn't go up and talk to him, you know. Mm -hmm. Wonderful character. The yeah, RLI so, loved him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So TFTC was uh, about five, 25 kilometers outside Predastal, you know, you turn off between Honiston, and it was next to the Overberg Test Range. Now, the Overberg Test Range was um, um, built to launch satellites. And it was actually funny, shortly after I arrived there, we had this announcement on the PA, the public address system, we must all stay in our office, offices and not look out the window. Of course, that's what you're going to do. <laughs> because what they did, they were doing a, a launch to test the, the rocket motors. And we just saw this massive plume up in the air as, as it went up in the air. And that, yeah. those were rockets uh, built in South Africa? I believe so, yes, oh. yes, yes. Or at least part of a design there. Um, I'm not too sure about that. Right. Yeah. Because they, the actual facility where they designed it was near uh, um, Grabo, more towards Cape Town. It was called Hotek. And and you must see the facilities that today are standing there empty, the, the most modern state-of-the-art facilities, and they're just standing there empty. It's very, very sad. Yeah. Terrible. 
Yeah, and then uh, just to, for the technical, more technical people and Air Force uh, um, aviation thing, just to mention that we at TFTC were responsible for all experimental flight testing in the SAF and support some of the industry. So we did everything testing from flight testing from um, investigations, weapons clearances. We did a lot of weapons clearances because there was a lot of um, local industry developing weapons, modified aircraft and new aircraft. Now, when we would do the test, we would install what we call flight test instrumentation or FDI, which is sensors all over the aircraft. And we have an onboard recorder and you can see it's always in orange, you know, like the black box. Mm. <laughs> it's orange. <laughs> so, so you could identify it that way. Now, I, I must mention, you can have hundreds of parameters, you know, like airspeed, altitude, hydraulic pressures, um, vibration, and they are measured multiple times per second. I had the case on a project working where we measured the engine mount vibration and it was each one was recorded 47,000 times per second so Jeez. it's a lot of data yeah. <laughs> and if if we would did critical tests that data was um, transmitted in real time by telemetry to a ground station um, where the um, flight test engineer would monitor the parameters ensure the um, tests are conducted safely and direct the test now in my time in the air force i came a few across a few extra addition air force members one of them at that time, uh, was one of your previous guests at that time, Commandant Neil Ellis. Uh, he was our OPS coordinator, or OPS as we called him. And he, he left, each, in his episode, he spoke about, he left the Air Force and started his fishing business, which was at Arniston. And then his boat sank. So it was the Oryx helicopter from TFTC that came and picked him out of the water <laughs> <laughs> when his boat sank. Another pilot, uh, well, the one time we had a task um, the uh, on a C-130, the, the crew, a squadron crew flew down to TFTC and the test pilot and I joined them. We did the test south of, of um, um, TFTC over the sea. One pilot was Rich Beaver. Now, Rich Beaver is mentioned in um, one prop's book, uh, the Air Force Operations, also an excellent book to, in my mind. They oh, actually brilliant. flew together. Yeah, yeah, they flew together at the squadron. And the other pilot was um, uh, Major Spoffy. He was South African, if I remember correctly. Now, he, I see, regularly comments on your programs, you know, in the comments. So he seemed to be a keen supporter of your of your yeah. uh, comments. I must say, these two guys, excellent sense of humor. It was the most entertaining flight test. And the other interesting part, we were about an hour in the air when one of them said tea time. So we, Andy, the test pilot, and I looked at each other. What's happening here? They put the aircraft on uh, autopilot and behind one of them stayed there and looked you know keep an eye over the aircraft and behind the cockpit is a galley where we could there's a small kitchen you know like make coffee so stood there drinking coffee and Andy and i looked at each other and said that man this is cool <laughs> but unfortunately we can get used to this but unfortunately that was the one and the only time that we ever had a tea break during a test flight that's good <laughs> Um, then another um, um, extra addition is Rick Culpin. You can see him here in the mm -hmm. left hand side. He flew Hunters um, with one of your previous guests, Steve Murray. The, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, this photo, thanks, was given to me by uh, Steve. Um, thanks to him. Now, both of them and Doug Sinclair was on that Mirage 3 project in South Africa. Um, in Doug and Steve's episode, they speak about that. Now, in the in the 90s, there was a project where the when one of the Mirage F1s, this one, was modified. The engine was, um, it was replaced with a MiG-29 engine, and this wow. is the aircraft itself. And Rick Culpin was one of the test pilots on that um, uh, project. He actually, if I remember correctly, did the first flight of that aircraft. Wow. So, um, um, why, then... Why, uh, why, why a MiG-29 engine? Was that superior to the French? French one? The, yeah, the, it, it just provided a lot more thrust, you know, mm -hmm. um, so it was to increase the performance. And there's actually a video which they took an existing F1 and this one and where they went to compare to each other where they turn. And you can see, like, for example, because of the excess thrust, it's, the turn is much tighter than the other one, but it's okay. to increase the the, the, the um, thrust of, wow. of the engine, of the aircraft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one project, just to give you an idea of the project again for the technical guys, is the aviation enthusiast, is this one. And I think it would be of interest to the ex DAC uh, crew members and um, as well as paratroopers. So the Air Force had this project um, where they re engined the DAC with a um, replaced the piston engine with a turbine engine. It was known as the turboprop, the TP mm -hmm. DAC. 
Um, it was also lengthened 41 inches. So because of that, you know, these modifications, the airflow all over the aircraft changed, especially including at the doors where the paratroopers exited. So we did all the flight tests at TFTC. There were some interesting tests we did on this one. Um, and the parabats came actually down to TFTC and they jumped and landed on the on the rugby field. So it was really nice to see them close up, you know, ringside yeah. seat of how they landed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, then another one we had again for the tech buffs is uh, a project um, over it, which was an all carbon composite technology demonstrator. And you can see the structure, the unpainted one is black because it's the, the carbon fiber is black. So we, we right. called it, it was so smooth, it didn't have rivets or anything. It was called the Tupperware or the plastic aircraft. Yeah. So um, I, I was appointed <laughs> as the project flight test engineer. So on the 29th of April, the test pilot and I, you can see us flying here off the coast at TFTC, we did the first flight. Um, <laughs> there's a story to the first flight because at that time, the Air Force had a project to replace the harbor train aircraft with new aircraft. One of the candidates was the Pilatus aircraft, and they were to arrive in the country on the 1st of May. So we were instructed to do the first flight before the 1st of May because they wanted to do a press release. We worked our butts off throughout the night, and as I said, we did the first flight on the 29th. Guess when did they do the press release? August, months later. <laughs> so, so. It was a classical case of the armies, hurry up and wait, or the uh, militaries, hurry up and wait. And that was, um, that was in America? No, this is in, in, in South Africa. The oh, aircraft wow. was locally, this was locally developed um, by CSR and Atlas, and then it was shipped down where we did all the flight testing, in, in, in the, in, including the first flight. I actually have a video of us when we did the first flight, you know, so, which is mm -hmm. quite priceless for me. Yeah. Then another project in, in the 1990s and the 2000, the Air Force embarked on multiple projects to re-equip the Air Force with new aircraft, um, the Grip and um, the, um, oh, yeah. the, the Hawk from Britain. So one of them was the Augusta A109 LUH light utility helicopter to replace the LO8. So I was appointed as project uh, systems and flight test engineer and embedded in the development process with Augusta. They now called Leonardo helicopters. They, they in Yovo is one of the, uh, um, Near, near near Salisbury or in that area. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so my wife, uh, two sons and I were posted to Italy. So um, we lived there for a few years. Uh, this is the helicopter, as you can see. Um, and this photo was taken in a place called Dormit Oslo on the border with um, Switzerland, where mm -hmm. we this day did the, 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 the flotation gear deployment, you know, if it lands in water. So yeah. We did the test that day, and you can see the top all in here so that when they land, they don't damage the bags, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, now, for any such a helicopter or new aircraft, one of the tests that's done is what they call cold trials. So, they deploy to a very cold place and see if it works in, uh, you know, test it in the cold environment. It's same is done for hot. But in the case of the cold trials, uh, that was conducted in Kiruna in Sweden in right. the Arctic Circle. And outside the hotel is a, outside the Kiruna is an ice hotel, and I had the privilege of visiting that. So everything in that hotel is ice. Wow. The structures, the, you can see the pillars, the tables, the chairs, the chandeliers, even the glasses that you drink out is made out of ice. <laughs> yeah, and then you can overnight in there, there's rooms. Um, it's apparently always minus five in the room. And you can see the base of the bed is is um, ice, and they've got these sculptures, carvings in the wall, you know, for oh, art. And amazing. outside the hotel is a replica of Shakes, uh, Shakespeare's Globe Theatre, and they actually have, apparently have performances in there. Yeah. Now, when I was there in February, they cut these big blocks of ice out of the lake, the frozen lake, and they store it in a big warehouse, like a big refrigerator, and uh, because the, the hotel melts in in the summertime. And then they have to rebuild it in the um, in the autumn. Yeah. And then, so at the end of that, I left the SAP. And then post that, I worked in the international aerospace industry concerned with the development of flight control and hydraulic systems for certification with the relevant authorities, mainly with the, the main ones being FAA and EASA. Mm -hmm. Some of the projects was this D-Jet, also a carbon composite, a very light jet. Um, the De Havilland um, uh, DHC-515 water bomber, very interesting project. Mm -hmm. um, then also the PC-24 utility jet um, that actually can land on unprepared 
the runways. So, and it's used by the flying doctor, you know, okay. also quite um, a lot. Uh, the global um, 7,000 um, business jet, later it became the 7,500. And this has got the, what they call the fly-by-wire flight control systems, um, also very interesting. And then I worked for a company where we would provide engineering services to startup com to aer aircraft company, aerospace companies, especially startups. Uh, we would come and do the work until they've got their organization running, and then um, they would take over. So this was one of them. It's the Arion supersonic business jet. Look, why, is why, the is, why is the cabin squashed in the middle over the wing? It's for the the muff effects at the, because of the supersonic effects you okay. you have to um the body for that um so but this unfortunately this one was cancelled when COVID came so we had just finished our contract before COVID when this one was cancelled but mm -hmm. um that wasn't on the task and then this one is the Alice all electrical aircraft very futuristic batteries all along the bottom to power the aircraft um, wow. But then I also worked as a flight test engineer instructor at the International Test Pilot School. And speaking of that, they have got a hunter, which they call the 5STA, the uh, fifth generation uh, surrogate training aircraft, because it's very expensive to get fifth generation aircraft um, to train the student, student test pilots and flight test engineers. So something like the hunter, which provides decent performance, this has been modified to have fifth generation systems. Now, this aircraft had been standing for a while. So when it came to the first flight and after the modification, Steve Murray, your previous guest, mm -hmm. he was involved in that. Gee. So he came and he flew. Um, he was the safety pilot with the test pilot. You can see him here. Um, he came and flew the first flight and a few subsequent flights. He's actually, it would be, if you're interested to talk to him, he's got, it's a very interesting story to talk about his experience flying the Hunter gear. And you know this, he flew the Hunter 45 years ago or so in the, Rhodesian Air Force and that skill that it was learned came in good stead, yeah, 45 years later. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's the end of um, what I have to say today. Yeah, Loris, I'm absolutely gobsmacked by your story and it, it just goes to show that somebody with very humble roots as, as a farm boy in the middle of Africa can come through to be involved in this type of work. It's absolutely amazing. And I think it's um, it's symbolic of, of all of our people. We we were always trying to move forward, always trying to progress. We, we had worth ethics, which yeah, are yeah. very much sought after all over the world. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. You know, they talk about the Second World War, people being a lost generation. I think people of our sort of period and from the country we came from, we're a sort of a lost generation as well. And um, yeah. we didn't just leave uh, Rhodesia and go and become bums somewhere else. Um, I had a school reunion a few years ago in, in Johannesburg, even though I was educated in Rhodesia. And when I spoke to the guys, there were about 200 of them there from Churchill School. I couldn't believe the occupations that they had. One was the head of a massive company. Another one owned an, an airline. Um, none of these guys just sat down and said, well, I've lost it and poor me. And you're a very good example of this. And it's quite remarkable. Um, I think it's been a brilliant talk and I really can't thank you enough for coming on board. Thank you, Tony. It's, it's uh, as I said, a privilege. And yes, to come back to what you just said, I, I believe anything in life goes about your fundamentals being in place, a sound foundation. And that's what we had growing up in Rhodesia in all aspects, you, you know, I, uh, schooling, you know, ethics, discipline, all that yeah. type of thing. And that that is what I think stood us in good stead for life to come afterwards. I think sometimes today it's a curse because that's not what the world wants today. Yeah. They want all the wrong things. But yeah. still, like I tell my wife and my children, uh, you always do the right thing. If, if you um, yes. go to bed at night and you lay your head down, you must have a clear conscience. And, you know, I even think back to my parents. They used to teach us, if you went and bought something and they gave you too much change, you don't give it back because it's not yours. And it's a small thing, but it's very important, those fundamentals for life. You know? Absolutely.